Good morning. For one that bellows every Sunday from the pulpit, I always get nervous right now. So this is the, the, um, just because I take it very seriously, um, and uh, my heart is that we would all learn. Uh, this has been on my heart for quite a time, and the Lord's hopefully helped me put it together. Um, uh, but uh, I'm just going to I'm just going to pray real quick. I know Karen did, and I appreciate that. I'm just going to pray real fast just because it'll chill me out just for a little bit. Because I'll go really, f- I won't go Trevor's speed, but I'll go fast and I'll get nervous. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lord, I just uh, thank you for these people. I thank you that your spirit is here. And I thank you that um, you, with your anointing, that my spirit would connect with your spirit and that the Holy Spirit would connect with all these people's spirits and that we would be changed from the inside out today because of who you are. And we just welcome the peace that passes understanding and we just shalom this atmosphere. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, good morning. I'm Brian, I'm supposed to say that. I'm Brian, I'm one of the elders here. There, that's done. All right, um... I'll get on flow here in a minute. I copied something from Alan's methods here. It's my first slide. Uh, another refrigerator picture, as Alan would say. Uh, this is um, Watchman Nee. Uh, I can't handle but so much of his books at a time because it will, it will devour me. It makes me feel like I'm in third grade or first grade when he's teaching master's courses, but he paid dearly for his master's course. But uh, this is the quote I was thinking about. God is not seeking a display of my Christ likeness, but a manifestation of his Christ. It's such a powerful thing. He's not looking for me to pretend to be a Jesus. He's looking for the Jesus to come alive in me, right? So just a a zinger from him that I could start, I could just stay right there and repent for quite a while, but we'll go on. Okay, let us build. This has been a while for, um, this has nothing to do with the last weekend, <laughs> this weekend, for this is going to be, that's totally something different, but um, I'm just going to try to communicate um, what I feel like the Spirit's saying in this season. I feel like the underlying rub for me is that I know that I know that what measure of faith and Christianity and understanding I have now is not going to carry me further. I have a tendency to be stuck if I don't something, there's not an exchange made that allows me to go deeper with the Lord. Uh, And so just wrestling through some of that for myself, and then you get to maybe suffer through it. We'll see. So uh, this is the premise, the base scripture that I'm starting with, Acts 4.12. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Period. Jesus Christ, God's only Son, the only way in. Everything else is illegal or wrong or is just not right. So that's an unflinching, unwavering principle. And so th- here it is, as it is, with, as it is with Scripture, at least for me, a small and simple sentence with few words carries a depth, a breadth, and height that is eternal. A shallow nod confirming that we know this sometimes robs someone of meditating on it or delving deeper. So sometimes the familiarity of certain scriptures, oh yeah, I'm saved, I got saved 20 years ago, it still, it robs me of the chance to maybe the Lord's got more to say about some of this. And so I just wanted to kind of start with that. Okay, here's some big principles that are going to be the underpinnings for where we're going. Something was broken. I know we all know this, but I want to, again, lay a couple groundwork kind of things. <laughs> Adam and Eve knew and were born into knowing God. They were born into Eden and lost it. That's a pretty, imagine, I can't fathom that, really. So the remainder of their lives, they mourned what they had lost but could not be recovered. I mean, to the point that an angel was put over the entrance and said, you ain't coming back, right? Pretty powerful. I'm, I mean, Adam lived, what, seven, six, six, seven hundred years? I don't know how many of that was outside of Eden, but think about that longing, that mourning. Now he's having to sweat and work and 
thorns and thistles before it was just all these paintings you see or whatever. (laughs) We are the opposite, born into sin with our spirits cut off from God. For those of us that have yielded to the call of the Holy Spirit to receive Christ, we are born anew, born again, saved, whatever word we want to use there. That which was dead was made alive, our spirits born of the Holy Spirit. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth, John 4, 24. So we see that we're kind of the opposite of Adam, so I'm thinking through some of this. So we've been given the privilege to accept the free gift of salvation of Christ indwelling us, so what we didn't have, we gained. So we're kind of, that's where I saw it as an opposite, but so Adam kind of broke it, and we're all kind of an Adam, and then Christ, of course, repaired it. He made a new way uh, through his own blood. So again, we all know this, but this is my underpinnings. Two big ideas. I love the book of Genesis. It's really cool to me how incredibly deep it is beyond just the surface reading when I was a younger Christian. So these two big ideas is, again, what I want to lay down as a principle, as a framework before we go into more what supplies right now. Big idea number one. We're going back to the garden, the serpent. So as Trevor has taught us well, the serpent is the one that introduced some of this idea. Man fell for it, woman fell for it, but the serpent introduced it. At the end of the day, I'm putting this in my words to save time on a message, but in Genesis 3 is where you can read all about this. But here's the offer in the garden. This is what, to me, it boils down to. God is holding something back from me. I can take control of this situation for my betterment. That's the lie of the enemy. God's withholding that tree from me, and my life would be better if I just go take the bull by the horns and go get this done. That's some of the same things I wrestle with in 2024, as Adam wrestles with now. So that's your big idea number one. Big idea number two, Tower of Babel. Oh, that's fast. I could stay all day on this. This is a powerful, for such a short little bit of scripture, it's a very, very deep thing. So Genesis 11. From the Tower of Babel, we learn some principles about who we are, especially outside of Christ, the fallen nature. Man has in their mind, will, and emotions that we can save ourselves. That's in there. Let us build a tower and be like God and be known. Now, what's cool to me, or not cool, but just in my understanding, you could put any word in there for tower. Let me build a bank account to be like God and be known. Let me build whatever, my kingdom, so to speak. It's in there. It's in. We see that in pagan man, too. This, this nature to want to build up and, and, and gain and grow. Let us use our knowledge, unity, and resources to build something for ourselves. That's that thinking. I'm going to call that later for the rest of the message, and we'll call that Babel thinking. So if you know where I'm... It's a default thinking when Christ is not in the picture. We are captains of our own ships. That's that. These are my words for Genesis 11, these takeaways. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a couple more stories out of the Bible as examples, and then we're going to go into about the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is my, my dad joke. All right, unholy cow, Batman. So we know this from Exodus 32, and it's actually interesting to me in Deuteronomy 9, when Moses retells this, he tells it in first person. It's like, you almost get the finger wag version of it. But anyway, so we know this story from Sunday school, perhaps, or whatever. But I really wanted to think about it. The Lord really took me through it, and I took it from the perspective of the Hebrew, the average Hebrew that's coming out of Egypt and hits this point, okay? So if you remember the story, and here's my setup for the Hebrew, the average Hebrew, just... There's all kinds of estimates on how many came out of Egypt, but it was a bunch of people, right? So you have 400 years. So for us, that would be like the Jamestown settling that far back. So we have 400 years of history of being in Egypt. This is all I've known is Egyptian stuff with some Hebrew in there. There's no Ten Commandments. There's no law. Suddenly, this guy shows up on the scene and says, 
I've been on the mountain. I've seen the burning bush. God's with me. There's literally this cosmic battle of plagues and all this stuff happening. Your circuits have got to be fried at what's going on. The death angel passed over. I mean, your whole, everything's getting shaken. You're, you're, you're rushing out of Egypt with all this gold and stuff, and Moses, boom, parts the Red Sea with that staff. I mean, it's, you know, I know Hollywood's done their best to make the movie, but I can't imagine being there. Now, here's the problem, though, for me. It would be natural for me to assume that Moses is the man. Before he showed up, where was God? That would have been my question. And he's my God connection, so I'm following that dude. Because he speaks to God, he uses his staff, he does things, and God's him. So they get to this place, Hebron, and, and Moses says, I'm going up on the scary mountain. That's kind of the way they always describe it, right? The fire and smoke, and, and the Hebrews are like, I ain't going up there, you go, Moses. And he says, I'm going to go up there and talk to God. Now, again, I'm the average Hebrew. I'm just feeding my kids and hanging out. I don't have the benefit of the Old Testament at this point. <laughs> I don't know how long he's gone. Now, he was gone for 40 days. I'm thinking like day 38, uh-oh. We just lost our connection to God. We just lost our it man. And now we're in a strange land. We're vulnerable. And our it man just left. And maybe he got devoured in the mountain. We don't know how long he's gone. We must save ourselves. What kicks in? Egyptian thinking, Babel thinking kicks in. How do we save ourselves? Uh, 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 we need an image. We need something to worship. We need something to do, to put our hand to, because we can't wait. We're, we're vulnerable, and our, and our God man just left. And we don't know if he's coming back. And what's interesting to me in the scriptures, Exodus 32, it says that they took that golden calf, as bad as that is, and they dedicated it to Yahweh. So it's not like they called it Isis or anything like that or, or Ra. They tried to dedicate it. So here you have a people taking matters into their own hands and trying to Godatize it. That could be a word. Trying to put God on it. Okay, we're going to make this idol. Does that make sense? Yeah. So my takeaways, and again, these are just big concepts. They, from their perspective, our connection to God has left. We don't know if he's coming back. We're vulnerable in a strange land. We need to take control. This thing is getting off the rails. We need to take control of the situation. Let's, let us build and do what we know. Now, if we come out of Egypt, 400 years of Egypt, what do we know? We know temples, we know altars, we know images to bow down to. Let us dedicate this calf to Yahweh. So again, I wondered in my own heart how many times have I yielded to say, well, God, you're not around. I think I'll take control of this situation. Matter of fact, I'll throw a scripture or two on top of it, and now it's Godatized, and here we go. Isn't this great, Lord? And, and, of course, we know the fruit of that <laughs> from the story. God was not happy. And you can read that for yourself. Next story. I'm just trying to paint a principle here. Don't worry. I know what to do. <laughs> I've said that one, and, and the Lord laughs. <laughs> All right. So here we have a situation. Uh, this, is, this is really powerful to me. King Saul, the tall, good-looking guy, when Israel said, we're tired of you, Samuel, we want a king. And they said, pick the tall, good-looking guy. That's Saul. And he was literally a head taller than anybody else. And so Saul's king. He's been through these battles. He's anointed. It is his rightful authority to be king of Israel. This is, God said, okay, you're king. But there's a battle with the Philistines, a big one. Chariots, horses, all the scary stuff of that time. A big scene. Of, and his men are leaving in fear. So poor, I feel bad for Saul. He's freaking out. Samuel is late. His men are leaving. He's not even going to have anybody to fight the battle with. 
So what does he do? I'll take control. I will make the sacrificial offering that Samuel normally does myself. Now, he exceeded his authority. That's one thing. Because he was king, but he wasn't the prophet. And he even probably did everything just right because he had seen it done. It didn't say that he did everything wrong. So again, he took what he knew and sprinkled some God stuff on it and hoped for the outcome. So my takeaways from the and it cost him everything. So that's in 1 Samuel 13, if you want to read it for yourself. So my takeaways, well, that yellow is ugly. I'm sorry. This is all falling apart, and I'm fearful. That's, what's, that's what I took away from Saul. I'm freaking out here. This is all back. God's late. I mean, how many times have I said that to the Lord? Are there any watches in heaven, Lord? Come on. <laughs> We're, I know what to do, so I will just do this one for myself. God, you're clearly not on time. I'll just take over because I kind of know the routine. He knew all the right steps but missed the Lord, and it cost him and his legacy dearly. His life, his children's lives, his kingdom's gone, the Davidic kingdom rises. Big cost there from the Old Testament standpoint. But again, it's the principle. When God doesn't do what I want him to do, does my babble mentality kick in? It says, oh, I know what to do. I'm smart enough. I'm clever enough. I've got enough things to do, enough resources. I'll build it myself. It's just a challenge. Because I find that God's generally kind of late sometimes, in my humble opinion, but his timing is perfect. Last one of my stories. This sermon's going to go pretty fast, so you can thank me later. <laughs> All right. <laughs> You're late. Another you're late story. So from John 11, we know this story very well. But the Bible does not waste words, right? It, it, everything's in there for a reason. So we see that Jesus receives word that Lazarus is sick before he dies, right? We know that from the scriptures. But Jesus chooses to wait. And we know, and some of us probably even been taught the Jewish understanding that after so many days, I think it's on the fourth day, you're dead, dead. You, there's no, back then, that you're, you're completely out. So Jesus waits to the point of no return. And then he shows up. And we hear this heart cry of Mary and Martha, rightfully upset. And, oh, man, Lord, you're late. If you had just been here, if you had just gotten here just a bit earlier, you could have changed. So they had this measure of faith that the Lord could heal, but maybe they didn't know the limits of the Lord. Interesting thought. How many times have I assumed God's late because I don't really understand that he has no limits? Because I've got God in. They had Jesus in this healing box. They didn't know about the resurrection box. And so I wonder how many times in my own heart have I assumed God's late because he's not operating in the box that I've kind of built for him. Well, God acts this way, and now he's late. If you'd only come sooner, Jesus. If you'd only been woken up in front of the boat, we wouldn't be going through all this stuff. So my takeaways in this light from John 11, you should have come when we called. I think that would have been her honest thing. We sent you word ahead of time, Lord, so you would come on, right? I mean, if that was, his, that was an honest, and it's honest. I mean, they, my brother's sick. I know a healer. Call the healer. Good, reasonable theology. God is late. Seeing a little pattern there. <laughs> now the situation is beyond repair. Mary and Martha are totally upset. Oh, Jesus, if you'd just been here. You just missed the opportunity. You just missed it. This situation is hopeless. This relationship is hopeless. These finances are hopeless. This, everything is hopeless. You just missed it, Lord. We did not know Jesus could do that. <laughs> right? I mean, he shook them, right? Oh, wait. Oh, you could do that too. I, we didn't know. We didn't know you were the resurrection and the life and the way. It... Again, the nature of man minus the Holy Spirit is to grab things by your own hands, take what you know, and build. That's in there. That is, there's that babble thinking again. That, seeing how that begins to tie in. 
even well-intentioned Bible thinking. It's, that's the most dangerous kind for me, where I try to sprinkle a little scripture on there so it works like magic sauce. Another way was made. Let me see. I don't know what slide I'm on. Okay. But we need some help. After the resurrection, the disciples know Jesus' words. They've heard these sermons many times as Jesus went throughout Capernaum and Galilee, teaching and teaching and teaching. So they could probably recite most of the Sermon on the Mount out of rote because they've heard it. They've they, they hanging with their teacher three years, three and a half years. They have witnessed signs and wonders. They've even done some signs and wonders. They are full of faith having interacted with a risen Savior. If you don't think your faith is stirred, sitting in a room, Jesus Christ just walks in, in the body, in the flesh, says, touch my scars, I'm here, I am resurrected. I'm sure they were full of faith at that point, right? Yet, they are told they do not have enough to fulfill the great commission of being witnesses. Now, isn't that interesting? I would think they are... They are double barrel, buckshot, ready to go, right? They got his messages. They got signs and wonders. They got full faith because they just saw resurrected Jesus face to face. But Jesus says, hold up. You don't have what you need. They're instructed to wait on the Spirit. Just a thought. So, I wonder if a New Testament informed, well-intentioned believer could have the word of the Lord, the faith of the Lord, and be missing the influence of the Spirit. Just a thought. Sometimes I feel like Scripture for me, or sometimes a thinking is more like a shotgun, and I'm just hoping something hits without the wisdom and the precision of the Holy Spirit. Okay, I don't fish because I don't have the patience for it, but this is what the Lord brought to my mind. I thought Ronnie and Tim or... Mike would appreciate this. But, so I had to Google all this. But, <laughs> or I remembered this from biology. Um, so there's something called a thermocline. Trevor will know this, I'm sure. So in lakes, you have different layers of water temperature. Makes common sense. The water on top's hotter because it's closer to the sun. And as the water gets deeper, we've all experienced you jump in deep enough, it gets cold, right? Those are called thermoclines. They're layers of, of, of water temperature. And... And there are certain fish that like different layers. There's some that want to be closer to the top, and there's some, like a catfish or something, that wants to be on the bottom. So a good fisherman knows where they're going, right? If you're fishing for this fish and you're, you're too deep or too shallow, you're not going to get it because you just don't understand where they're at. This is very simplified. I know fishermen can correct me. There's a lot more to it, but it's my sermon. So. <laughs> So different depths yields different catches. That's my point. Okay? So this is what the Holy Spirit, I feel like, kept prodding me with. What depth are you fishing at? This is my picture. So my heart, my thinking. So this is, again, this is just for challenging. You can disagree or not, but this is one for me. My shallow is my emotions. My deeper is my mind and my will. But the deepest fishing is in the spirit and is supernatural only. So the depth I set my hook is what I'm going to fish out of, right? If I've got the bobber and I've got eight feet of hook, that's when the bobber sits on the water, that hook can't go any deeper, right? It's there. So keep this in mind. This is the ultimate gift of the Holy Spirit that our spirits were made alive. And our spirit can now commune directly with Holy Spirit inside of us. This is so much deeper than our thoughts, our will, our feelings, or feeling his presence as our only barometer. So, for me, the challenge has been in this last season that I've only been fishing out of shallow waters. And the problem with the shallow water thinking is... If I'm fishing out of my mind, will, and emotions with a little God sprinkled in, then what happens is I'm in this murky situation where I'm having to make real-time decisions about family, about money, about relationships, about church, about all these things, but, but I've got this mix 
of my mind, my will, and my emotions, and knowing that the Holy Spirit's not there, I'm going to babble the situation. I got this, Lord. I know what to do here. I'll call you if I need you. Now, I would never say that because I'm too religious, but that's what my actions would do. So the question for me was, the challenge of the Spirit is, how do I... Now, it's no different. Here's an analogy I was thinking about. Gasoline, we all understand fires, ultimately is the pow in a, in a, in a, in a car no mo, in a uh, motor. And so, but the pow of the motor where it hits the piston and pushes it down and turns the crank, turns the drive shaft, turns the transmission, turns the differential, the power is expressed through all the systems of the car to ultimately your wheels turn. It's really no different. The pow of the Holy Spirit still has to be expressed through our mind, will, and emotions. But our mind and will and emotions can't be driving the car. That's, see the difference? And so sometimes I get caught up in the mind, will, and emotions, assuming it's the Lord, or assuming that my mind, will, and emotions have been Christianized enough that it's safe to make all those decisions out of it, and neglecting the deeper thing, which is spirit to spirit. That's my point. Real world examples. Um, so I typed this out a little bit to keep me. There is a relationship in the past that has been hurtful. Sometimes happens. Something happens. The Babel response in this relationship is I must save myself. Protect my heart and emotions. React with anger, isolation. Chew them out, ignore them, talk about them. This is your golden calf moment. The Holy Spirit is not around, so we think we must save ourselves in this relationship by whatever means we can come up with, but we're fishing in too shallow of a water. See that relationship? See that babble thinking, even in a relationship? He hurts me, I'm just going to avoid him. As opposed to saying, Holy Spirit, what do I do? My spirit to spirit, I say, eh. And what am I doing? I'm saving myself. And the Holy Spirit's not going to work with me in that because I've taken control of that situation. I've said, you're, you're not worth getting to, you're not worth fixing the relationship. You're out. I've saved myself. I've built my golden calf. We receive $500 unexpected. Our first thought is what to do with this newfound money. Our mind, will, and emotions immediately goes to work on outcomes, wants, needs, ideas. We must now save ourselves with our wisdom and knowledge on what to do with the money. What if the Holy Spirit had another idea or perspective? How would we ever hear the thoughts of God in our spirit, if our spirit is not open, and all we get is the sounds or noise of all the shallow elements. Just a thought. There's been many a situation. Money is one that yanks my chain pretty quick. I hate it, but it's just true. And I think it's because I went broke a long time ago, and I walk with a limp. Um, but the... That it frustrates me sometimes I get caught by that. There'll be a money situation and immediately I go to my budget, my thinking, return on investment. I mean, I'm, I'm all over that. And then later when I get myself in trouble, I'm like, oh yeah, Holy Spirit, I need you to bless this. This is a great idea. Didn't you, weren't you, weren't, weren't you here? You know, I mean, it seems that silly, but how many times do we quiet ourselves and really hear spirit to spirit the gift that we've been given that says the most incredible, creative creator of the universe lives inside of you and wants to come out and wants to work through you and wants to manifest in you. But we say, mm, mm, mm. You, you stay in your corner. I got this. I'll call you if I need you. And it's, a, it's an interesting dilemma for me sometimes. Church life doctrine. I didn't even type this example. You all can go there. People that take one scripture and that's their everything or take it out of context or they're willing to die for this or that and wars have been fought over this kind of stuff and it just, it blows my mind but I feel like a lot of times that's because it's in their mind, will and emotions that they've interpreted all this scripture. 
And so it's subject to the murkiness because I feel like for me in my mind, will, and emotions, the thing that makes it murky is I've got some worldliness in here because I'm a, I'm a product of my American culture whether I like it or not. I mean, I try to set myself apart into the Lord, but I'm still, and there's some good in that and there's some bad in that. I mean, the Marlboro Man is not necessarily a Christian idea, but it's still, there's something in me about self-made man and, you know, that kind of thing. So it's all in there. And so when I fish or when I'm reaching in my mind, will, and emotions, I've got worldliness, I've got religion, I've got Christianity, I've got preferences, I've got expectations, I've got disappointments. It's all in there together. It's, it makes for it hard for me to get consistent results. Sometimes it works out really well, and sometimes it goes really bad because I haven't really gone to the spirit level and said, my spirit to the Holy Spirit, then what comes out? Because it may be totally different than what I was thinking I was supposed to do. Over time, if we do not heed to the still, small voice, we forget it's there. I know lots of believers, and I've had seasons, where you think you're on cruise control and the Holy Spirit's nowhere to be found. That is dangerous. You might as well close your eyes and drive the car. We forget it is they, we forget the still small voice representing the Spirit is there, and we operate out of our knowing. We babble. This can result in good things, but it can also result in bad things. But not the eternal, because we are not connected to the vine. We are used to saving ourselves with our wisdom, efforts, and defenses that it just seems like our only natural way. So the danger for me is the more I ignore Holy Spirit's voice, the more I default to my babble mode that says, I got this, I'm smart enough, I can figure this out, I can Google it, whatever, and boom, make some decisions. And I run a real risk. And I probably will not bear any fruit. If I do, it's accidental. So, question is, how do we go deeper? I think I'm getting real close here. I have no idea. My time? Oh, yeah, good. Sorry, Let me regroup here. So, it's one thing to say it, it's another thing to do it. Right? It's kind of like, for me, it's like nutrition. Just because I know what to eat doesn't mean I eat it. Right? So, thus the biscuit I had this morning. All right. <laughs> Yeah, it was good, though. I think in church environments, it doesn't count. <laughs> it's my theology. I'm trying to prove that in the Hebrew. All right. We only have so much capacity. Now, this one's speaking to me. Maybe you, maybe not. The rule of one, right? If, I remember telling a, a guy here recently, I spent, what Tanya knows me very well, sadly, um, like I did an addition on our house when we were younger. And, and, and I, thankfully, I'm very thankful that I can do electrical plumbing, heating, and air. I can do all that stuff. I can frame, I can roof, I can sheetrock. And so I chose to do that and built this large addition on our house. But I was telling a young man who had young children, I said, but you know what I didn't do is before I sat down to build that, I didn't say, hey, Brian, are you willing to give up your next 30 Saturdays with your family to save 40 grand to build your own addition? Because I didn't want a 30-year mortgage on it. That was dumb. I wanted it to be in cash. So if I built it myself, I could do it in cash. But at the same time, too, I had to soberly say, okay, this is going to cost me the next 30 Saturdays. Sun up to sundown, working my tail off to get this done. Now, I may have made the same decision, but at least soberly, I would have understood I only have so much capacity. And if I give it over here, I'm losing it over here. So we, we follow the principle here that, that works for all of us. We only have so much capacity. Some things must go to make room for the real. Generally, most of us have all the Jesus we really want. To go further may cost too much. I might lose myself, my life, or my lifestyle. I didn't like to write that because it hurt, but I wrote it. So, I mean, I put it in here. I had a dream once about revival. I went through a revival. I was telling, Tanya and I went through a revival years and years and years ago in my 20s. Saw some incredible things. It was, blew my, all my circuits out when I was a younger man. And it was gone. We lost it. And I had a dream years ago 
if there was a revival and I was doing like this. I wouldn't reach for it like this. I reached for it like this because I knew it was going to cost me too much to really grab hold of it. I short-armed it in the dream because it hurt too much to really take it because it was going to cost me, inconvenience me, everything. It was just going to cost me. So I'm going to leave you and the Holy Spirit to work through that sentence, and I'll say it again in my closing. But it's true, if we're honest, most of us have just enough Jesus that we want because to go deeper it cost. There's something that has to give because most of us capacity is full up. I'll let you and the Lord. So these are the things to remove and then the next slide are the things to add in. Potentially. Again, I submit this humbly. It's biased because it's coming out of my own heart, but hopefully the Spirit's in it too. Surrender our rights and desires that we demand. The Lord wants it all. No division. I have a tendency to want to categorize things said unto the Lord, this is my little corner, Lord. Kind of like my house. Tanya likes a nice, clean house. I have one office in the corner that looks like the bomb went off. My little kingdom, I like control over it. But the Lord doesn't work like that. He wants the whole thing. Accepting that there may be no sign or emotion or outward thing that happens to validate the truth of the word. We can't seek from outside that which is already inside us. If you have the resurrection power, Holy Spirit, inside of you, there is no other thing you need other than to connect. Sometimes I want Lord to do a little dance or do something for me, move, move the lectern back and forth, send me an angel, make some smoke happen, do something, Lord. The Lord says, my word is enough. It's true, and it takes a measure of faith to lock into that. And that faith skips my mind, will, and emotions. That's deep, because the faith comes from the Holy Spirit. Accepting that there may be no immediate answer to come, that it's on his timetable. That one's really hard, too. There is no drive through window at the church, right? I'll take two healings and one blessing and make that to go. I'm in a hurry. And, I mean, that's the way I'd set it up, Lord. <laughs> bing, 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 done. That'll be $12. All right, but it doesn't work like that. We have to go in knowing this is about changing us and being changed into his likeness. And he's going to have to, you know, by the time that fire hits and it goes all the way through the transmission and out the tires, there's a process there. Practical steps. Hey, that went backwards. All right, we'll see what happens with this slide. Um... Yeah, practical steps. So worship, corporate and private, and you all know these, so I'm not, but it's more of a setting apart to them, I think, the spirit of it. it I just want to reemphasize the thing that I got from this is the danger for me, even in my quiet time, even in my Bible reading, even in these various areas, I can still do this at the shallow level. I can still do this in the mind, will, and emotions. Okay, I read two chapters, Lord, check you know, I prayed, check, and have that kind of mentality, and it's all still right here in my mind, will, and emotions, how I feel that day. Today went well, God loves me. Today didn't go well, God doesn't love me. I mean, that whole toss to and fro by every wind of doctrine, that, that to me is your sign. If your emotions drive the car, if you're swinging like this in your emotions, it's because you're not deep enough. The promise of the Spirit is much deeper than that. It promises the peace, promises the joy, promises the stability that no matter what comes at you, you're like, uh-uh, I'm in me, I'm settled. Papa's got this. So I just, even some of these Christian things can be done at this shallow level. So the, for me, the trick is asking, Lord, how do I worship in the Spirit? How do I pray in the spirit how do I read my bible in the spirit and not the rote of the written word again this is an ebb and flow it's a relationship with a person so you get to work that out uh, let's see a few practical ideas for those who hunger for something more stable I think that was a key word I felt like in my spirit I, I've got a couple friends that are believers they say they're believers 
And they are like, I mean, it's like hill, valley, hill, valley. Everything that comes along is, oh, my God, you know, and oh, happy day. And it's just, and it, it's exhausting, <laughs> I would think. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm a little bit like that, if I'm honest about my insides, but I, I, I guard it much better than that person. Um, but I just felt like if you're looking for stability, perhaps to go deeper with the Spirit, because ultimately Paul says that we, the Spirit witnesses to our spirit that we are children of God. It doesn't say that the Spirit witnesses to my mind, will, and emotions that we are children of God. It says the Spirit witnesses to my spirit, spirit to spirit. That is the, it was interesting, I was thinking, I'm going to digress for a second. I was thinking unsaved Brian, pagan Brian, about 20 years old, and saved Brian. Both have a will in mind and emotions. Both making choices in life, trying to want things to go easy, don't want to be sick, want to have good things. The pagan version and the Christian version. So really the only difference is my, my spirit is alive. My spirit was dead. So that tells me, just like the disciples saying, hold up boys, don't go out and preaching just yet. Wait for the spirit. That spirit thing in us must be a really big deal. But I got to connect to it. I can't just assume that it happens. Showing up time and time again in a designated place, set apart time to hear and learn. That's, again, a choice what that looks like. The Psalms are full of that kind of thinking. Even that, you know, you have to mix it up sometimes. It can become the danger of being rote, the danger of, of doing it mechanically. But, you know, the Holy Spirit will work with us. He's good, but I, you find that showing up and showing up and showing up, he, he kind of likes that. He is a person, you know. Bible study, more than reading, more of a chewing of the cud. You know, the danger of just chapter, 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 check, check, check. Really getting lost in a scripture or two, going down a rabbit trail with the Holy Spirit, is, that can be the cool part. Some of these overlap. I'll, I won't pretend they won't. Meditation, you know, the New Age world tried to steal that word, but that's our word. And that matter of fact, it does mean that one of the versions of the word meditation is the chewing of the cud. It's the chewing on, sitting there gnashing your teeth with the scripture, trying to turn it over in your head. So meditating, silence before him, learning to obey the whisper. Silence is hard. You know, maybe the, the cell phone's not working today is bringing you some peace that you hadn't had in a while. <laughs> um, prayer that is from Steve here, prayer that is real, continual, and loving. Um, learning to pray in the Spirit. And I don't just mean tongues. I mean positioning yourself in prayer to say, what do you want me to agree with you? Because I've got an opinion, Lord, but I don't want my opinion. It got me in this mess in the first place. I want your opinion. <laughs> uh, then the worship and good fellowship that builds faith and sharpens iron. There's no question there's no lone rangers in the kingdom. We are designed to do this together with brothers and sisters. That's his intent, that I'm not going to, as Alan so well said today, if I carry A and you carry B and you carry C, we may end up with a whole alphabet here in the church, but not one person carries all the letters except Christ. Okay, I'm done, I think. This is my closing. <laughs> I'm going to summarize a couple of things and I'm going to hush. And let's see. 1152, all right. So just in closing, some challenge. This is the things I have to do. Uh, here's my risk, and I've said this about Steve's messages. The picture I always have is the same. I've said this before. It's like a blacksmith. If you, especially if you take a blacksmith, not in modern times, but you take a blacksmith in olden times, where you had to go out and chop the wood, you know how important it would be that you would not build a fire and heat iron for any worthless purpose? I think I'll just build a fire and just heat up some iron for no reason. Yeah, bring the marshmallow. The smith put the iron in the heat to shape and mold it to his will. So the heat of the Holy Spirit in this moment is to bend and shape our will to his and not waste the fire of it, if that 
That's always a picture for me. Do you find yourself captive to emotions or your will and ways and wonder where God is? Your mind and emotions getting tossed about with every issue. Just a challenge. Have you made any golden calves to save yourself? Such as internal walls, cutting people off, hoarding money or resources, speaking judgments on things you have no authority in. There are many means that we have to serve our interest, to protect our control or our comfort. There's our many golden calves that can be built. All well-intentioned, because I promise you, I feel like the Hebrews did not build that golden calf to be an insult to the Lord. They built it because they thought they knew what to do. Is your first thought your own to save yourself, your family, your situation? Have you stopped in a situation recently and asked the Spirit to help you know what to do or say? That's hard. Man, when I'm on a roll at work, people are asking me questions all day, and Tanya will ask me a question, and boom, I'm fixing it. <laughs> That's not what she's wanting to hear. I don't she want to fix, she want to talk. The Holy Spirit's a person. The Holy Spirit's a person. It's not a mechanical insert this in, get this out. He's a person that wants a relationship with you. He wants to talk this stuff out. And he may have ideas that I don't have. Very likely he has ideas I don't have because his ways are above my ways and his thoughts are above my thoughts. When was the last time you really heard the still small voice in your quieter times or do you have any quieter times? The noise of this seasons of life can be just the media, the, the this, the that, this political season, my own brain. You know, some nights I don't sleep well because my brain is just rumbling with stuff. And, and it's really hard because I've just always pictured God saying, I am the most important thing in your life. I will not shout. You must yield your heart to hear me whisper. The Lord is not going to yell over you. If he does, as Trevor said once in a sermon, if God has to shout, you're probably in big trouble. <laughs> um, and as, are you as full as you want to be of the Lord? Be honest with the Lord. For some, it's just like, look, I'm comfortable in my life right now, Lord. I got the measure i am used. I'm good. I don't really, my family's saved. I'm okay. I pay the bills. We're good. And, and that's not really where the Lord wants to stop. Uh, but he is going to work with an open heart and the invitation. So, again, these are in closings for you to consider. Uh, let you and the Lord wrestle that out. And uh, I think that's it for me.